Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy. This is Mark. We get to uh, talk to the builders and futurists changing the way we interact with the world. Uh, and we get to do it on a weekly basis. It's a whole lot of fun. There's a lot of new technologies we talk about. There's a lot of impact to culture that we consider. And um, yeah, another we're week. We're doing it live. And that's why we're a bit late. And, you know, it doesn't always go smoothly, does it? But it's live television. That's a fact. That's a fact. It's always fun, though. It's always fun. Mark, give me uh, give me a perspective. Uh, I know you're super curious about this topic, about DeFi, about uh, zero knowledge, all this all this stuff. Tell me what uh, where your head's at with this and how we want to tee this discussion up. Banking the bankless decentralized finance. Yeah, I am interested in it. I've been following the I'm coming, I've been following the airdrop meta a lot. So the eigen layer drops, the layer zero drops, a lot of these new block lanes, scroll, linear. There's a never ZK sync in a few weeks and our guests chain ZK link. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of layer twos. And today we're talking about layer threes. So just when I think I've got control of something, they build another layer on it. And I kind of, oh, I have to hold, learn a whole new paradigm of tech that I didn't really understand layer two. So I'm coming at it with a curious mind, but also a confused mind. I find ZK, I find some of this tech incredibly complicated. And when people try to explain how ZK technologies and EVMs work, I thought, God, I wish I understood more. <laughs> How about you? That's right. Yeah. So philosophically, all of this stuff is super intriguing, right? And 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 technologically as well. But it's like it, it's like we want to really we want to really boil this down. So so the, both disruptors, people who are building in this world, and the curious minds who are not building in this world, not even interacting in this world, but are interested in this world. We want to we want to keep that in, in in check as we as we go through this discussion. So, man, let's 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 jump in. First of all, we want to thank uh, our sponsor. They've been with us for quite a long time. Ripple, W R I P P L E. Ripple is marketing's on demand talent platform. If you need a group of interdisciplinary experts or one very disciplined individual, uh, they can point them at your project. Whether it's a week long or a year long, these guys are great. Over three thousand vetted solopreneurs uh, specialists that they can organize and point toward your project, W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com. Let's intro our guest, Mark, and let's jump into this discussion of banking without banks and money without uh, centralized figures corralling it. Awesome. So yeah, engineer, crypto tech enthusiast, former Bitcoin miner, I believe. And since 2001, uh, the CEO and founder of ZK Link, Vince Yang, welcome to Thinking on Paper. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Mark. Nice to Thank have you Thank you for here. having me here. i excited. And could I, like, were you a, a Bitcoin miner? Is that how you got into crypto and blockchain yeah, originally? Exactly. And often in Shanghai. And I think uh, BTCC, Bitcoin China people were organizing this event together with the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, so some of these early this Ethereum uh, co-founders were there. So I was uh, introduced to the idea of blockchain technology and also being Ethereum. It was also mind blowing for me. And then I, after three years that, you know, I read about the white paper, but I wasn't really like I was still working on something else. Right. And in the year 2019, suddenly a friend of mine, a very close friend, more than 10 years, I returned from the USA and, uh, you know, he decided to join the business and, you know, just, just started Bitcoin mining. And then we had this three months debate and I found out that was eventually I was convinced I wasn't like a believer in the beginning. And then I got convinced and I said, OK, we're going to do this. This is so cool. We're going to do this. Yeah, so this is how we got started. And then uh, uh, we uh, about a year later, we, I, we, we found that there are actually a lot more happening in the space, a lot of builders are building cool stuff. And we decided to, you know, to, to learn more and dive deeper into the technology. And so we joined a, a the, one of the largest decentralized exchange platform to, as a, you know, just to learn as a platform where we could learn quickly and more about the industry. And we stayed about there about a year and, you know, did some different stuff, rotated on different function departments. Uh, including you know, blockchain technology itself, and also like you know how you run a centralized exchange business, 
like institutional, you, you deal with institutions, you deal with retails, you deal with assets, a lot of stuff to learn. And after that, and uh, we found there's uh, something cool about the zero-knowledge proof. And uh, it was at the time that we I got introduced to zero-knowledge proof, actually. I, of course, myself, I came from engineering background, so I know a little bit about coding. Not, I'm not a like, kind of like a key appearance that actually for zero-knowledge proof. I do, uh, Sharp and you know myself at language. Uh, uh, we have groups of engineers and one we decided an interoperability protocol using zero to proof because we envisioned or we imagined that uh, the future of blockchain landscape even inevitably will go to multi-chain. There will be multiple layer ones and there will be more layer two. And here we are, we're saying like hundreds of thousands and maybe thousands of maybe this yeah, is already how we the project. got it yeah Years amazing ago. amazing and there there's there's always a moment that that, that that pulls you in when new technologies are out there and and i think a lot of people are on the on the precipice of those moments and and you know especially not not just the build the builders are in right but it's like the people that we're building for are on that precipice of like hey is this going to make sense what do we want with this um but hey let's explain zero knowledge proofs ck proofs <laughs> real quick and, and let's try and come on this. vince this is the let's, question like, i have done this like, well, maybe more than like 20 times on different well, let's, stages i, I would that, like vince i would love to do it in a way um because because basically what it does in general, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm super simply, right? Is it, it, it governs a, a, a transaction between two people or communication between two things, right? So let's say we have three things right here, or even just Mark and I are two things, right? And how did, how could ZK work as a pro, work as a technology to facilitate an interaction between Mark and I as entities? Yeah, that's uh, actually, I think that's a very, a uh, special way of asking this question. Uh, let me think about it. Actually, we're doing something similar because we're doing multi-chain protocol. So basically, we're trans transmitting information between multiple chains. So there are multiple parties involved, right? So because essentially, the way we're doing this is that or the way that the uh, zero knowledge proof technology is involved in this is that you take the computation, the information, and the process process it into in our off-chain ser servers, off-chain service, and you process the data. You know, do the you, you do the computation, and then you commit the you post the results, and the statement of the results that contains whatever information you know the result of you 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 could be transition of states, it could be transactions, it could be change or your plan balance of your your accounts, and to these multiple parties with a zero knowledge proof, a state root and with a proof, and this proof can be verified by the wiki uh, by the prover contract prover contract this is a kind of uh, you know smart contract that does the proving process that the results you or the information you receive from this uh, proof together with this proof is correct because this proof can be verified so it means that you have removed some some data from like one party and it does the computation in the middle any way you can do with that, as long as this is, it, 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 you can generate a proof, as long as you are able to generate a proof, it means that it complies with this uh, proof system. And then you send that result together with the proof and it will be verified by you, by the other party, um, then the, your statement or that information carried with the proof is correct. Well, this is still too, too, techno, too, too tech. This is too technical to explain this. But simply, I think for the for, for more uh, general users, is that I make a statement to you, and you can verify this statement with a, another information that contains in this statement, and you have a specialized way to verify that. And it's all mathematic equations. It's more mathematics behind. So you don't need to believe me whether I'm saying anything true or not. As long as you can verify that proof and this contract or the way to verify this proof is already uh, in the system. 
it's, I, it's, it's open source and it can be verified. It can be audited by engineers, by scientists. Okay, let's re use a real world example. So we're, st we're talking about finance. So let's stick with finance. So say, because I, I want my dad to be able to understand this kind of. So let's say that I am opening a new bank account and the bank want proof that I have a house and a job that earns X amount of money. But I don't want to tell the, the bank where I live or what my job is or how much money I earn. I just want them to... Um, yeah, that's show, basically show the abstract to a statement of your revenue. And so how would that, behind the scenes, like how, how would that proof manifest? Uh, yeah, so basically, so what we could typically do is that we take the revenue information from the entity that is generating the revenue. We get the information and the process that the data and, you know, generate a proof and send that proof to your bank account, to your bank manager, where we have a pre deposit, uh, deployed contract or uh, a, a program, software program that can verify this statement. It's just a proof and this statement and it's true. Then what are your state, what are you are stating is true. Got it. So instead of, so instead of, you know, me being the facilitator of an interaction between Vince and Mark and me looking at a piece of data going from Vince and Mark saying, Hey, that's, Hey guys, this is the right data. There's a computer model that actually asks, acts as that verification methodology, but how, like, so in the long run, I understand that as, as someone who understands technology, but how do you get people to trust computers? Yeah, that's a difficult <laughs> I guess you have on the mask to, to be able to verify would make sense to you. So a lot of mathematical people like scholars and engineers are doing that for you. So basically, uh, you can do some experiment. You do experiments with the, this kind of a system, right? And a lot of people, the more people using it, and then no one's getting rocked or nothing funny or nothing suspicious happens, and you know that this system is actually working. And of course, on the design level, this, you need to have like these professionals to verify would this, whether this system is as robust or as secure as they de as they. Uh, declare or what they, they, they state. That is why there's also security companies in the industry that does this for users, right? You need to have a third party that are the professionals that are able to tell would the, are the codes correct? Are there not bugs? Or what are the consequences if there's a bug in the codes? That this is also the reason why we're spending a lot of resources on auditing as well, because we, don't, we know that our users, the developers, that another specialist in the space won't understand the mass or want to understand the tech on underlying, but instead they will trust these reputable third party security companies to make the judgment for them. Yeah. I, I love your question, Jeremy, because you assume that people don't trust technology and people are very suspicious of technology on the one hand, but on the other hand, technology flies our planes and drives our trains and makes our food and Exactly. curates our existence and we trust it blindly without asking too many questions on the whole but i think there's something particular about maybe finance where exactly there, yeah there's a when it comes like, to funds people are tend to be more careful right because it's just like you know you make a mistake and your life savings could be gone like like that um so people need to be extremely careful with the with the technology that they're not familiar with. That is why education is super important in the space and it takes time. Since we're not having overnight because this kind of trust does not build overnight. You need to make these things work. You need to demonstrate that they work well over years. Then this is also what's happening in the DeFi space, right? A lot of protocols and why they're popular now because they, they appeared three, four years ago and during the past three, four years, nothing happened. Nothing, no incident happened. The, are simple and they running fine. So then like a lot more people, a lot more users will feel comfortable to use them. So that is why new technology adoption always takes time. But in our space, in the crypto space, new, te new technology actually adoption is already faster in a, than the traditional fast sector, in my opinion, right? Because this information flow is so fast, you can always discover new tech. 
on a daily basis, you know, a lot more cool stuff appearing every day. Of course, there are a lot of scams, there are a lot of like, you know, like rocks, and, you know, funny stuff or uh, insecure uh, or ingenuine uh, products in the space. So uh, that is something that is, uh, this is something that is blocking the mass adoption at moments, right, people, because you could make a mistake and uh, lose your life. And that is why genuine builders need to stand out and present and educate and work with other institutions. And you, when you, uh, the more reputable institutions, the more uh, <clears throat> key players you are working with and the more trust and the faster you can build the trust from the you know, retails and education is always the key education and also hard tech speak for itself but it takes time yeah it's one of those things that, and this is more so our, our conversations always go between like the culture and the tech right so this is more on the culture side more the humanity side that you know number one humans love shortcuts right they love shortcuts that they trust right and once they trust the shortcut you know, they'll continue to use that shortcut to make their life easier. Like it's, it's like ways, right? Using, using ways to get from point A to point B. It's very easy. It's very convenient, but I'm also giving away all of my personal data. I'm not surprised time. to see that happening because you, the most, most users or today is arguable that there are more users on Telegram than, and, and, and a lot more than on Uniswap and Telegram, that the Telegram posts, they're very centralized. To be honest, you, yeah, people are trusting Telegram, the, the, the company. Trust is more more difficult for them to, to and, and all takes other steps, a few steps further for people to access. But um, you, you you just need to click and then you make a trade. So what happens behind is actually the you have a centralized entity that handles your fund, transfer your fund, and make complete that trades for you. And this is a better, a lot better user experience and a lot easier access for retails for you know common users and uh I, I, it makes sense and i hope that there will not be no security incident in that about the, the the amount of trust or the amount of funds they're handling there is crazy and so uh i believe there will be more users will be growing base of users on decentralized products like uniswap that have proved has a proven track record that is proven already to be safe and uh and also they're relatively speaking simple and as a complicated the, system like a zero knowledge proof will take an even longer time i, I want to get the, into to like the zk link in the layer threes but with uniswap obviously like they got a wells notice from the sec there's a lot of <laughs> um regulatory barriers to 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 more adoption of DeFi. like i i think and I might be wrong because I don't, I have I don't actually know the numbers, but sometimes I feel like maybe the DeFi system is almost kind of circular in nature. Kind of people move from one protocol to the next, kind of experimenting, discovering new protocols. But how much new money is coming in, and how much of it is existing crypto money from the from since the, the dawn of it? I, I wonder that sometimes. This is I think there are two parts of this question, right? One part is about the regulation side, and one part is about the how much, how many got so far, and how how, how much more uh, money flowing into traditional sectors. And regulation part that is very difficult to discuss. This this is always yeah, a course. debate there. And Uniswap is the leading protocol in the DeFi space. Of course, they're being chased by the regulators, and uh, there's no surprise in that. Uh, I think there's up to today. I think they're doing fine, and they're they're they're, they're doing their legal battle. There is uh, is fierce. I hope them to hang on there and help them to win. Of course, and everyone in the crypto hope that they will win the battle in the end. And uh, uh, personally, of course, we believe that Uniswap is nothing has nothing to do with this kind of like you know regulation risk. This as long as they're able to implemented some like travel rules to try to stay away a little bit from those dangerous uh, money flows, right? Related to terrorists or, you know, money laundering. That's, I think that's the, that's, that's the topic that these regulators trying to discuss with Uniswap. It's not a, you know, as a retail user, as a genuine retail user, just making a trade on Uniswap. I don't think there's anything particularly wrong about that. I think it's good, it's revolutionary. It's, it's new tech changing people's life. 
making people's lives easier, making the whole financial system a better place. And in terms of the new money or the new users that are coming into the industry, in this, at this particular moment, I think we're seeing a lot of growth, especially after the ETF got approved. And uh, I think the people are still also hoping that uh, Ethereum also will get approved at some point. And then this will drive more people, will drive more confidence, will drive more user adoption. At the same time, builders in the space are doing hard work, working daily, every day, day and night to improve the infrastructure to improve the user experience, to improve the product uh, user experience. User experience is, is the key, right? Because uh, people can do not really want to understand what the zero knowledge proof is. Like, you know, if you use a cell phone, you don't really, really understand how the hardware, like in, inside your phone works, mm -hmm. right? You you are you actually want to use the, pro, the software products. You want to make a phone call, you send a message, you don't want to understand what chips you are using, right? Which, 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 which uh, or you don't want to discuss with people which uh, supplier you, are, you, 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 want to, you want to choose. So these, all these in, uh, blockchains or the layer one, layer two, layer three, I think in the future, will have to be abstracted for the end users. And people just need to, just want to use great products that offers great user experience and that are seamless, accessible, easily accessible, and that are cheap, fast, and then they can easily understand, intuitive. And yeah, it's like it's like it's like getting on an airplane and not need needing to know how the thing gets up in the air. You know, I know. Yeah, you don't need what, to study the engines, right? You probably two percent of people. Two percent of people understand that. The rest of us are like, "Hey, I think this is what it's supposed to do." Right? Let me let me ask you something. So this we talked about ETFs and um, or you know the Bitcoin ETF and all of that. Isn't it ironic that like a centralized technology has to be largely adopted using the inverse of it? So you know something you know decentralized becoming centralized and run by a collective to show its value, right? Like, I think that's the nature of like where we are as a society, but yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. My understanding is that um, the approval of ETF means uh, uh, approval from or has highest authority. That's, this is how human society operates, right? You, if you want to, if you want everyone to use crypto, then the government is something inevitably you have to deal with. Right. So, and uh, ETF approval means this official kind of approval from government to, rec to recognize the value of crypto technology and the cryptocurrency as a sector, because uh, Bitcoin is our beta, right? It's the largest cryptocurrency and also uh, it's, it, it, it is more than 50% of the market, market cap of crypto. So it's, it's a very important signal for the people that are involved in the space and also outside the space that, okay, this thing is not a scam. This thing is, is legit because they're there. They actually, a lot of people are doubting crypto because they, they don't really understand the time. They don't really have the time or they don't really take the effort to, to try to understand. But instead, if the government tells them, okay, this thing is actually legitimate technology and it's going to change people's life. Okay, then they will probably have more interest. Okay, I will give it a try. I'll give it a shot. And this, this will expand a lot expand to a lot more interest and of a lot a, a, a larger a lot more larger population in uh in the global market that is why etf is so important for everyone involved in the industry and we're so excited about it too yeah it's a decision shortcut for large it's exactly people, it's a decision right? shortcut yeah. yeah not everyone wants to take the heavy lift of like you know understanding the, the tech or a whole new industry it's too much well, let's let's talk about. I know Mark wanted to get into this too. Let's talk about zk Lake and let's talk about you know. So basically, we we talked about zero knowledge as something sitting in between uh, a, a communication, a transmission of data, a transaction, whatever it is, to kind of prove that hey, this is what it is, right? And we talked about multi-chain, right? So there's multiple paths for that transaction to go over between two entities, right? So you're talking about layer three. Tell us about zk Link and who are the people that you're looking to have implement this technology uh, and, and, one, and yeah. one question that why do we need layer threes and what, what do they what do they give us that the world didn't have before cool yeah so i will start with the question with zk link okay so in general zk link is building um, blockchain infrastructure that aggregates and abstracts the complexities and fragmentation of different 
layer one blockchains and the layer two rollups, there are many different kinds of layer ones. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, BNB chain, they're layer ones, but they are different, right? You, they, they cannot perceive each other's states. They, you cannot make a direct trans transaction. And the, the, you have to have an interoperability protocol in the between to, 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 to uh, make a transaction happen or to uh, transfer funds or whatever operation you do on the two different blockchains, you need third party in, the, in between. And also there are thousands of layer twos on Ethereum. And there are going to be thousands of layer twos on Bitcoin. I mean, not. I mean, technically, technically speaking, like the layer twos are early stage on Bitcoin, but uh, there will be more because it's already there, right? It's already emer emerging. And uh, Zikalink is building a solution to abstract away complexities and the fragmentation of difference differences in terms of the ledger technology, the the, the wallets, and the user experience among these different blockchains. We provide a one-stop access, a unified access to these different layer one and layer twos. And we are EVM compatible and also have applications specific for high performance applications. So we have two platforms, right? For the EVM compatible universal purpose platform, developers can build any kind of applications on our layer three, which is aggregator that abstracts the differences of layer twos. And you then the users to use these applications will have the direct access to the funds, liquidities, assets, interesting opportunities from the different layer twos. So instead of like understanding 10, 20 different layer twos, they can stay on this aggregated layer three and access to opportunities and applications assets to, from these diff, 20 different layer twos. And this layer three can sustain the security and inherit the security from the this layer one, which is Ethereum. So with, without making compromises on the uh, on the security side, that's just okay. the reason why energy proof is needed. Perfect. Let's let's unpack just the the, the, the top half of that because I think it's really interesting. So if I'm selling something, if I'm a Web3 company, I'm a startup, I'm trying to, you know, I have a product that I want to distribute and sell to the masses using blockchain technology, but I want to open up access to people on all chains. So if you got Solana people, if you got Ethereum people, if you got um, you know, whom whomever else, right? I want to make it accessible to everybody. So this is a building block that my development team would partner with to make sure all of the coordination between chains is happening is that is that a fair statement yes there's a way to you for us to work with your uh, we can provide the roll up in front of you to have the access to any that are in proof verification we're not saying that we can support or smart contract platforms that can verify such proofs. Yeah, we're able to ag aggregate that and provide a unified access for you. So it's, 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 it's abstracted and simplified and unified access for you to build an application with. So you don't have to deal with 20 blockchains and we'll do that for you. Exactly, yeah, that's actually a very good example for developers. And for users' perspective, if you use your one, your application has already direct access to these 20 different blockchain assets and applications. So that means abstraction and aggregation and a simplification. And you guys are invisible to the to the user level, right? You know, when someone goes- No, 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 no. I, I don't think so. Be, on, on, we, we're still functioning like a typical blockchain. Uh, the, okay. Today, we were not able to 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 to, to just uh, cut that off. So, so, so people still have to connect with our chain. So we're, so we're like doing one chain for many chains. This whole so, idea yeah. of abstraction, just to simplify, because I I, did, I wasn't really aware of this concept of abstraction until they started making crypto wallets, that, which would abstract the uh, the complicated. But essentially, abstraction means to remove the complexity and the visibility of the reliance on the technology, like from a user perspective, like abstraction. I think we're talking about a little bit of different abstraction here. Uh, so the abstraction I'm talking about is the abstraction of the technology stack that the developer has to actually deal with chain by chain, right? So this is abstraction for these developers. And for users, we're abstracting them to, to allow them not to have to make transactions or cross-chain transactions from to, among 30, 100, 1,000 blockchains. Instead, they have one unified layer that gives them access. Any application in this layer already have the abstraction underlying, underlying. Yeah. 
So for your, you, you are talking about abstraction, maybe more on the account abstraction, where you completely have taken away the existence or visibility of the blockchain yeah. underlying from user's perspective. I think that is the next step and it's already happening. There, the AI solution providers is trying to abstract away the gas tokens right now. So you don't need to have to pay different gas tokens and buy different gas tokens. So it's actually taken, it's, it's, it, we're, we're taking the, the way like step by step. Right now, I think the abstraction is on the infrastructure level on blockchain for developers of the applications. And at the same time, there are other builders trying to provide an abstraction of accounts where users just to use the uh, applications without you know, feeling like they're using a uh, blockchain. So they buy a token and they do whatever they want. They would use the profit features like it's swap or lend or borrow or do a trade. Then uh, they don't really feel like there's a uh, blockchain underlying. A very good example or comparison of this kind of user experience is a centralized trading platform. You go to Binance, you don't feel like there's a blockchain, right? There's only you have to make a transfer. You want to make a transfer to the account, and you probably you can bank part with a and you're still not doing dealing with this. You want your or personal other, uh, uh, you have to select the blockchain because these transactions so, so there's a still a bit of like exposure interest platform but if you, you are just okay you just make trades you buy whatever tokens there they, they won't you they won't tell you which blockchains you are using because the all these tokens are abstracted and aggregated in their centralized database but so, we're doing, we're trying to match that user experience by using energy proof, so it's, it still remains self custodial, and it still remains right secure. And your 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 key, your token. Thank you for clarifying that. That makes sense. Yeah, as I, as I'm thinking through this, and I always I always have these. Speaking of abstractions, I'm trying to like relate this to like simple analogies, right? So, from the developer side, right? If I'm a developer, you know, looking to try and transact on as many blockchains as possible without without going to each one of them and building this whole stack. So instead of building a road to all of these different uh, blockchains, I build a road to you and then you handle the last mile into those blockchains, right? I'm building one road to you. You are the one connecting everybody else, right? Yes, correct, correct, correct. And, good, and, good and analogy, it's important Kevin. to understand that we empower the builders to build a universal purpose of dApps. And for a lot of more interoperability protocols, they are trying to also connect the blockchain together, but they are doing this for transfer and of funds, liquidity and the transactions. They are not like, they do not function like as, as a blockchain. We are a blockchain that offers you a smart contract platform with access to thousands of blockchains. So there's still the trust mechanic on, there's always the trust mechanic, but there's a trust mechanic from developer to you guys, because, you know, it, they would know, like if they developed all of this individually to all the different change, it would take forever, right? Uh, a lot of things could happen, a lot to manage, right? But they have to believe your connectivity and your infrastructure to each of those chains is equally good as if they would have done it themselves if they were a really good developer. So there's, yes, how do you build, yes, how do you build, yeah. how do you build? Uh, they don't need to really trust us actually. As long as they can read our documentation, they will understand that this, our architecture is using their energy proof. So the way we connect to the other blockchains is completely trustless. Yeah, because trustless. like I said in the beginning, that's we, the, we post the data, we post transactions, we post the transitional states of our blockchain to the other blockchains using our, their energy proof and that can be verified. So it, it is validity proof, it is completely trustless. The state changes can be verified by mass, mass by equations, by so it's not a place in trust on us on the builder team. So the system, the system, as long as it functions correctly, there's no back, which I mean, then this platform is trustless. So whatever transactions happens on this platform will be verified by ZKP technology on the underlying base chains. So this this kind of protocol is used in this way. So we can. And we can we we so that we call ourselves a, a we inherited the security of the underlying chains so there's no additional security trust on, on us on the 
uh, platform we're building. That makes sense, but it's like bonkers for like regular people <laughs> to understand because it's like you're building trust without trust. Yeah, like, yeah. Wait, so this that? part, I think it is not meant for right. users. I think it is more for the developers. That's just why we have very detailed. The whole, the whole of crypto is bonkers at the moment for people outside of crypto. I think that's one of the one of one of the beauties True. of it, but also one of the the hurdles of it because literally, like if you spoke to non crypto people about what the hell is happening and like what people are doing. It might blow their minds, I think. And that well, maybe is. Well, here's here's the thing. This just popped in my brain. Another weird analogy, right? So how long is it going to take for people to trust uh, mathematics, right? So if you think about, I just look back to history, right? Uh, slope intercept equation, Y equals MX plus B. The first time that come out, came out, people were like, yeah, you know what? I don't know that that thing's going to work. But over time, people believe Y equals MX plus B will get you <laughs> to points on the graph, right? And they finally did. But like, it's going to take some time, I guess, right? Yeah, it will. Right. The concept now is already been very popular. A lot of, a lot of projects are adopting this technology and a lot of capitalist tension, uh, exposure, a lot of discussions like, the, you know, like the right now we're doing one, right? I'm looking to retail to end user understand a little bit better how this tech functions and why it is important and what what the value add and how it's a great potential in this not only in cycle negative but I think it is to be what are the biggest questions what are the biggest questions you're getting in some of those trainings that you're that you're running what are the most common questions that that come up and how do you answer those about about the layer space or about the zk just anything as you're running through these trainings with these in institutional investors with these you know, or whatever whoever that uh, might be yeah. Uh, yeah particularly with regards to the platform that we're building because these technologies at a cross section of different sectors uh, so there's uh, interoperability there's in there's in, and also there's chain and zero knowledge proof uh so it, it, it takes a little bit more effort to understand what we really do and, and how it functions. A lot of times we were asked about you know, how you deal with the security, what is the security assumptions, how you transmit, how you transmit the message among different blockchains, how do you make sure all these transactions are properly settled and uh, what is the boundary of your security assumption and what if one of the layer two or layer one fails and what, what if like, you know, what if the, the, the layer three fails, right? So there's a lot of like assumption or uh, uh, discussion on the security issue. And then and they, I think it's particularly important among the developers to debate whether they think could correctly in long term. And from retails, I think they, they just try to understand what the benefits, what are the, what, what, what does it mean for the users? Right? What, what, what is the value add? Why do I care? Why, why do I need to use application on the layer three? Why, why, why do I need to use a, uh, why do I care about the ZK link, right? Uh, and also, actually, Mark asked a good question about why people care about layer threes, right? Uh, there's a few important things for me personally, I think particularly uh, that makes layer threes special. Number one, it's a lot cheaper. Uh, I think we need to, uh, really uh, keep in mind that the transactions nowadays and um, to make a transaction on the blockchain is just too too expensive for a lot of a lot kinds of applications let's say socialify right we, we have de-socialify we have friend tech we have farcaster we have telegram town network don't get we mark have, started on farcaster uh, well yeah. no, but just on that they said there's a um an, a decentralized email platform called dmail like catchy title and you can send emails on like scroll or linear or yeah yeah, yeah. Well, so and it's it, kind of and it costs like 28 cents to send an email it's like no thanks that's too expensive though no that's too too expensive for two yeah. but but what if it costs like 0.02 for you to send an email, then 0 0.02 cents I'm talking about. Makes sense, right? It will be, and I think the three, three now making real progress 
by lowering the transaction cost to retail users. So now people like feels a lot more easier speculating or making bets on meme coins and people having fun making bets on meme coins because this costs nothing. It costs less than 0.1 cents to make a transaction on the layer three. And it could be even cheaper in the future because the layer three is going to be cheaper. Because blobs. Uh, been, yeah, blobs and uh, new DA solutions and also more efficient proof systems, implementations and, and putting progress on the engineering side. These cost reduction of layer twos will benefit layer threes too, because layer two, layer threes set on layer twos, so it's cost less. And layer threes are interesting for some applications that do not want to share the bandwidth with other applications. If you build a general purpose layer two, you probably will have 200, 200 applications. One that suddenly got a lot of inbound volume, it will stack that it, you will use up most of the bandwidth and other applications will have to compete that and you have a gas war. And if this gets worse, and even after gas wars, the trans transactions still become slow. This will not be acceptable for some financial pro products like high frequency trading, like water book trading. You know, you, you want your average charging, you're doing high frequency trading, you want to come, you want to complete like 10 trades within a second, but you don't want, you do not really want to share the bandwidth with other like NFT projects, with a game projects. So you definitely want to run your own chain where all the bandwidth is for you, all the TPS is for your application. You have a, more, a lot more stable environments. So curious, curious, yeah. yeah. Curious minds think about this. You pay for a, a ticket to cross a bridge, right? And you know, a ticket to cross a bridge costs 20 bucks and you want to cross it whenever you want to cross it. But all of a sudden there are a million people crossing it right when you need it. Uh, and then that's yes, how you yeah. When you need it, you don't want to, you don't want to share. So yeah. like high, high performance applications, including audible trading, this is financial applications. So they need to be extremely careful with what they promise and what they can actually deliver. Because one incident, people can lose like millions of dollars. And for gaming projects, the same, right? You don't want your 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 your, your, your server. <laughs> so suddenly, you cannot accept that transaction, and you get ah, click click a hundred times. So this, this this transaction does not go through. So this kind of, if you were talking about a real application that people really use on daily basis, then you need high performance. And the layer three is giving that high performance in the sense that it does not share bandwidth with other people with other chains. So layer three, most of the time, people are doing yeah. one application on one layer three. And we're doing this different because we're mostly focused on aggregation of liquidities, trying to enhance capital efficiency. So we're not going to too too far, right? For like futuristic, uh, high performance gaming project or order book. On us, we want to still sustain the composability and still have this DeFi. Uh, we're taking a gradual approach, right? Uh, on our layer three, still universal. You can still have 100 application, 10 application, 500, 550 application that, you know, compose with each, uh, with each other. The, the core value proposition of us is that unified access, aggregate, aggregated liquidity, higher capital efficiency, simpler user experience. But uh, for other layer threes, they were building for certain type of application. So they go in the vertical approach that they build one layer three for D chain, they want to build a chain just to bet on, on meme coins. Extremely cheap, fast. And then you have like uh, uh, other layer threes like gaming layer three, right? You have seen that you, you this, this is this 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 chain is for one game project. So you have one application running on this chain. And for there will be other verticals like social, like uh, in your real RWAs, uh, well, let's use our imagination. There could be a lot of other, can, other use can cases. I, can I take that further then? Because if, so it, uh, imagine a future that's not too far away where every brand has, instead of a website, they have their own chain. Would that, so you have like the McDonald's chain or the Chrysler chain or whatever it might be. Would that chain be a layer three or and this might be a stupid question, is layer three the end of the line? Do, do, is there a world of layer fours built on layer threes? Would like, would This nine... may sound stupid, actually. I think this may sound stupid, but I do believe that the layer fours are possible. <laughs> We're, well, we'll stay, as, as if, if you, you have a layer three that becomes too big and very particularly successful, then you need, you have another layer. This is, you can, you can stack up. Uh, 
as long as it makes sense in terms of economic and uh, gain, and also the trust assumptions that are acceptable for your users, and also it makes sense in terms of the finality speed. Each layer you add, the finalities on this layer one will, will, will be slower. On layer two, you set for seven days for OP, for ZK layer two, maybe one day, 24 hours. Right now, I'm talking about right now, but in future may take like one hour or 30 minutes. On layer three, and you set on layer two and layer two set on layer one. If you want to gain the security from layer one, you need to wait for layer two to settle first. And layer three set of first on layer two, layer two set of layer, layer one. So this propagates. So the means layer three finality is slower than layer twos. If you want to inherit the layer one security, and for layer four, then you need to for layer three, layer two, layer one. And so your transaction settlements will, you have to wait for days and weeks. If it still makes sense for your user, for your application, then why not, right? Because layer four, it will be cheaper than layer three. And you could, you could be, there could be some benefits on layer four. But in the near future, I don't think people will rush to layer four. I don't think there's a need for that because layer three, as I said, it's already extremely cheap and already user-friendly in terms of the cost of transaction. And the layer three are already making some trust assumptions on layer twos and has sacrifice and on the finality. Uh, and uh, for what was the other question again? Well, like if, if, if for example, like a brand wanted to create its own chain, it's like in the future. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, like, I think definitely, would, I think definitely, layer three is, is is on their list. I think they, they, yeah. they definitely think about the layer three. That's where the, that's where they would do it if Nike wanted to build a, a chain. That's if they what think, they would if, do. yeah, because layer three has a. Actually, we have a little bit of like a presentation here. Is that layer three? We're talking about layer three on Ethereum. We're not talking about layer three on Bitcoin, right? Because Ethereum is the largest smart contract platform and a lot of people building layer twos and these layer twos are actually functioning very well right now. A lot of, a, 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 and a large amount of funds already on these layer twos. And there, these layer twos are going to have native applications, native assets. Then it makes sense to have these layer threes to spin up to avoid traffic within this layer two ecosystem, but a tap to their, tap to their ecosystem. Right. So and, all of this owns independent uh, bandwidth, independent resource, completely self-sovereign and completely, you know, owned by themselves. They, so they can they can run this application, and it's just their three is easy to build. Make no mistake, their three is not the, like rocket science that is extremely hard. Their three is just simple. It's very simple to. It's very similar to layer twos. And there are a lot of Rust providers that can do the engineering lift for you. And for a brand like McDonald's, they say, okay, I want to build a new chain and I only have this, this, this purposes for an application features that I want for this chain. Then it makes a lot of sense for them to consider using layer three. Building a new layer one is also one of the options, but again, there's always some other alternative options like using Cosmos SDK layer one. But if they want to stay within a Ethereum ecosystem where um, there are most of the liquidities on smart contract platform. You like 30, 40 billion, uh, 300, sorry, 400 billion, and you have layer two, so a lot of native assets can appear. And you use an application that you want to tap to this liquidity and assets, you want to stay close to where the other applications are, because it makes sense, right? You want to build a new building in New York for a lot of reasons, although it's very crowded and it is more expensive, and it could be, but if you you can also choose to build uh, in the middle of maybe Korea or somewhere where it's a lot cheaper and you have a lot of other gains, but yeah, I think, I think what's happening that's really interesting for, for our listeners to, to, to be thinking about is the idea that, you know, just putting something on chain is no longer just going to one spot and, you know, doing it that way you have to be really mindful of like what's going on chain what are the relationships you're trying to manage what is the volume of transactions so there's a lot of these different questions you need to think about and then yes. from there make a very prescriptive you know internal recommendation and then find the tools uh to build it vince this is this has been a super fantastic conversation i know we could probably run on for for quite a bit longer but i definitely want to be mindful uh, of your time and your energy um i have one question uh, that I want to ask if you're open to it. Mark, do you have anything you want to ask before? I, this, this is Go more of it. a funky thought experiment kind of question. Go um, for it. All right. So Vince, um, I was having, uh, I was hanging out with a friend of mine this weekend. We were, we were up in the mountains. We were sitting down kind of chatting about tech and all things blockchain. He's a developer. He's a network guy. He's like digs into this kind of stuff. 
And I, we started talking about the idea of like, all right, so the value of all these cryptocurrencies, right? And the value of all of these technological tools that are being built, why is why is the value of power financially not matching like so you look at like you look at like um like stock in a power company right now and then you look at like what ethereum's doing or what bitcoin's doing or what uh, some of these other things are doing like none of this happens without power right like none of this stuff happens without power why aren't we seeing a massive fluctuation in the value of power these days fluctuation of power i do you I mean energy Energy, energy, energy. Yeah. So like, so like what electricity, it, what I, electricity, like literally what I have my computer that's running this call plugged into, right? The value of that is a resource. I, I think, you know, I don't hear a lot of, I mean, it's a weird question to think about, but I don't, I mean, if that wasn't there, none of this stuff would happen. So you'd figure like to power that, the value of that would be tremendous or even more. I think they're building oh, yeah. huge, think huge power plants all over the world, but they're just not telling you about it. Uh, it's a, I actually had a little bit to, I think it's interesting. Um, we, uh, I talked with friends before when I was still mining Bitcoin, right? We have this discussion on, you know, what is the nature of the business of mining Bitcoin? And you know, we came to the conclusion that this, this is very similar to the energy business. Uh, it basically consumes energy and uh, produce Bitcoin. So the price of Bitcoin can be predicted based on the amount of energy you consume on the, on the average cost of the energy consumed to provide, uh, to pr produce a Bitcoin, to mine a Bitcoin out of the, you know, network. So I think this is already a, a pretty common way to calculate or predict or to use to, to, to model the, the, the price fluctuation of uh, uh, Bitcoin, especially when it comes to having, we, we, last month we just uh, finished the, the, the most recent halving and people always talk about the cost of energy that to, it takes, how much it costs to, to produce a Bitcoin nowadays, because they, it's, it's, it, it keeps going up, right? And POW, this model, this consensus is, 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 is playing that game, is playing the energy game. Basically, this is there are two parts. Core, the, 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 the two cores of Bitcoin mining is energy cost, and also the uh, the, the the ASIC chips, the miner, uh, and and energy cost is more long term, and the miner is one time cost, and energy cost is on daily. You have to pay for that, and this the, the, the people use these two factors to basically the model to predict their revenue income and also to predict the the price of bitcoins based on the in the hash rates, of course, everything combined. And for Ethereum, smart contract platform is very different because POW are most now seen as a way to decentralize and sustain a network that stores value rather than to make real applications. I, I personally am not aware of any smart contract platforms that are getting popular based on POW. People are trying very hard to unleash Bitcoin liquidities onto smart contract platforms. So people are building layer twos, people building Bitcoin restaking Babylon, this new stuff happening. I personally think my, my, my personally think it is still very early to say whether would that be successful or not, because it's too experimental. The technology is this premature and there's a lot of challenges. And we see from engineering perspectives, a lot of things not making sense, <laughs> but something the design, something is making things because there's a reason that why people are investing in that, right? So people are definitely seeing great potential of the possible future that a Bitcoin entering smart contract platforms. POW is not doing that. So they have to first of all, go to apply smart contract platforms. And Ethereum, on the other hand, has switched from POW to POS. I don't want to go too into this debate of the history and why they made this choice, but the conclusion is that they think that this POS is a better way to decentralize the network in long term. So they have like more than 20,000 nodes nowadays, stakers, to ensure the decentralization and, and uh, security of the whole network. But they, of course, at the same time, there's another group of people that the Bitcoin Marxists think that the POW is the only way to sustain long-term decentralization to make sure that nothing could be manipulated. And POS, at the same time, people are arguing that this is some centralization, some like, nodes that are controlled by, say, like, you know, a centralized entity. Again, my personal view on this is that smart contract platforms are adopting, already adopting POS. 
So that is why I think this is the reason why that energy is not really relevant to our discussion when you talk about technology innovation, because a lot more of, the, a lot more of technology advancements in the space happens on smart contract platform because smart contract platforms enables people to build real applications. There you have it. Disruptors and curious minds, Vince Yang, dropping knowledge about zero knowledge. How about that? Um, ZK link, stay, uh, stay in the loop on what they're doing. Um, Vince, we'll put together a, a great write up on this and we'll share with everybody where they can. Thank find you very much. You. I actually forgot to mention that we're already live on minute. So we're not talking about this concepts assumptions we're talking about something that is working really well you guys are welcome to try it out you can follow us on our twitter you find our website on our twitter you can also go to our website directly zk.link you will find our applications we'll find the smart contracts you will find out the how the system works there's documentation and also there's a lot of more updates coming we're already by far the largest alerts today by the way where there are 500 million of us dollars on our chain right now over 400,000 of unique wallet addresses i think there's like at least I think 200 or 300,000 of real people that have tried our product. And some of them really liked the technology because it's cheap, as I said, and it's fast. It's not only an empty promise, it's already something real. People can already use it. We'll be sharing all of that, Vince. Um, I have looked at it. It'll be out on the website, on our blog posts, and on our YouTube channel, Thinking on Paper. We're there, we're covering it. Check it out. Um, <laughs> Awesome, quick, awesome. Uh, quick, yeah, quick final thank you to our friends at Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E. They are marketing's on-demand talent platform. Do you have a project? Do you have a need that eases a little bit out of your internal expertise? Put a note out to these guys. They'll assemble an amazing team of interdisciplinary folks. They'll point them to your project. It'll be done. Lickety split. They're great. W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com. Uh, Mark, quick note about the book club. Tell them what's up real quick and we'll get everybody out of here. <laughs> We've got a book club. We read books. So what? Get, yeah. Books like The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman or Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish or The Nexus by our former guest, Julio Otino. Um, yeah. Thinking on paper X, Y, Z until well, at the moment you can't read it there because the website's been hacked, but don't tell anybody that. Speaking of security... <laughs> Yeah. Be curious, stay disruptive, keep thinking on paper. Take it easy.